Okay, let's talk about neural development. Plasticity is the brain's ability to change over time. It's also called neuroplasticity, a term that you may have heard before. And development is a change in the brain over time, mainly early in life. Those changes are due both to experience, what the organism is experiencing in the environment, and also physical maturation, which is really just another name for pre-programmed changes in gene expression that occur in cells over time. We can better understand development by understanding how neurons develop, understand how their axons connect to each other, and also how experience changes the course of development. Only about two weeks after conception, the rudiments of the nervous system start to form. Now, I don't mean that you're already, you already have neurons and things like that, but the, the basic structure starts to uh, emerge. At that point, you're really only a ball of cells, undifferentiated. All the cells are just like all the other cells. Uh, but starting at about two weeks in, what will become the dorsal surface starts to thicken and forms what's called the neural tube, surrounding a fluid-filled cavity. The anterior, or forward end, of that tube starts to enlarge and starts to differentiate into different parts of the brain, the hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain, initially. And then the rest of the neural tube becomes the spinal cord. The inside of that tube becomes the ventricles of the brain, and also what's called the central canal in the spinal cord. On the left here, you're seeing the embryo at about two weeks old. You can see the beginnings of what's called the primitive streak here, this little groove that forms. It starts on the posterior end and works its way anteriorly. This is really the first stage of development where you get some differentiation, where the cells start to become specific kinds of cells instead of just generic, undifferentiated cells. Over here, just a few days later, you can see that streak, that primitive streak, the groove has worked its way all the way up to the anterior part of the embryo. Interestingly, this, uh, this primitive streak forms as a result of a, a rod-shaped bundle of cells just underneath the surface here called the notochord. And the notochord produces a protein called sonic hedgehog. That's not a typo, that's really what it's called. It's uh, one of several hedgehog proteins. Uh, the hedgehog genes in general play an important role in early development. Those neural folds start to fuse and form a tube. And then the first somites form. The somites are these little lumps along either side of the developing spinal cord. This is at about three weeks in. And you can see the anterior and posterior ends of that tube still open. By 24 days in, you've got most of the tube fused, but again, the anterior and posterior ends are still open. Here we've got a cross section through the neural tube at this point. Here's the neural tube itself. You can see some somites on either side. And there's that notochord, which produces the sonic hedgehog, which induces cells around it to start differentiating in particular ways. This is showing you figures from your book illustrating the same stages in development. By about three and a half weeks in, you start to see the beginning of the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. Although at this point, the nervous system is really mostly just a tube. You can, however, see the beginnings of the eye here. This little lump coming out of either side will eventually become the eye. The eye actually starts as kind of an outpouching of the developing brain early on. At seven weeks in, forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain have started to differentiate more, have started to grow more. At 11 weeks in, again, the forebrain and midbrain have gotten much bigger. The forebrain especially will continue to grow and grow and grow and, and cover up all of the midbrain and most of the hindbrain as well. And this is what the brain looks like at birth. And you can see the forebrain covering up the midbrain entirely and covering up the big chunk of the hindbrain as well. By birth, 
the brain has essentially the same structure that it'll have for the rest of its life. All the sulci and gyri are already there. All the structures that are going to be there are already there. Though there are quite a few changes that still need to happen. At birth, the human brain weighs about 350 grams, but it has almost all the neurons that it ever will. We do make some new neurons in adulthood, as we'll discuss in a little bit, but most of the neurons that we're going to have are already there at birth. By the first year, the brain weighs about 1,000 grams. So in just a year's time, the brain has almost tripled in mass from 350 to 1,000 grams. Where does that extra mass come from? We note that the brain isn't really making a lot of new neurons, so what's growing? The answer is mainly the dendrites, axons, and glia. You don't get a lot of new neurons, but the neurons themselves can grow. They can grow new dendrites, new axons, and then lots of glial cells form, especially forming the myelin sheath around the developing axons. And then the adult brain weighs about 1,200 to 1,400 grams. So you can see most of the, the growth occurs in the first year of life. In fact, the brain is about 90% of its adult mass by age 5. There are five steps that all the neurons in the brain go through. Proliferation, migration, differentiation, myelination, and synaptogenesis. Now, in reality, there are a few neurons that don't undergo migration, but almost all of them do, and certainly all of them undergo the other four steps. Let's address each one in turn. Proliferation is just the production of new neurons in the brain. You and I and every organism on the planet started out as just a single cell. But now we're made of many, many trillions of cells, close to 100 billion just in the brain. How do you go from zero to many trillions of cells? The answer is cell division. That one cell, the fertilized egg, divides into two, two divides into four, four into eight, and so on and so forth. Most of this proliferation, most of the production of new neurons occurs in utero, before birth. At its peak, we're producing about a quarter of a million new cells per minute, which sounds like a lot, but when you have to go from zero to several trillion over the course of just nine months, you really need to move quickly. Early in development, the cells lining the ventricles divide. Again, the brain at that point is really kind of a tube, and the ventricles are the, the hole in the middle of the tube. The cells right around the ventricles are where most of the cell division is occurring. Some cells there become stem cells that continue to divide and divide and divide and produce new cells. They continue the proliferation. Others stay where they are or become neurons or glia that then migrate to other locations. That's the usual fate for these neurons. Migration is just the movement of newly formed neurons and glia to their eventual locations. Most of the cells in the brain are not born where they're ultimately going to live. The migration can occur in a variety of directions throughout the brain, but mostly it occurs radially, moving from right around the center of that tube outward toward the edge of the developing tube. Although sometimes the neurons migrate tangentially as well, sort of moving around the edge of the tube. This migration can occur in a couple of different ways. One way is by the cell following chemical paths in the brain, paths of proteins called immunoglobins and chemokines. These are signaling molecules, kind of like hormones, but uh, more like local hormones that tell developing neurons where to go and to some degree tell them what kind of cells to become. But developing neurons can also migrate along radial glia. We mentioned these briefly in the first week of class. These are glial cells that act kind of like roadways along which developing neurons can move. As the name implies, they radiate outward from the center of this tube out toward the edge of the developing neural tube, the edge of the developing brain. Let me show you how this looks. What you're about to see is a short video time-lapsed over about 160 minutes. Right over here, you've got the ventricular zone. 
So this is the area of the developing neural tube right around the ventricle. So the, the empty space in the middle of the tube, the ventricle, would be right about here. And out here is the cortical plate. So this is the edge of the developing brain. What you're seeing here is a young neuron pulling itself up along a radial glia. As the name implies, they are oriented radially, going outward from the center of the tube to the edge. And you can see this neuron pulling itself out. You can also see another neuron moving tangentially in this direction, sort of around the tube. This is another neuron moving along a radial glia. It's kind of a close-up shot. The next step is differentiation. This is the formation of the axon and the dendrites, at least for neurons. But really, more generally, it's the process of cells becoming whatever they ultimately are going to become. For neurons, it gives them their distinctive shape, and it gives them their distinctive function. It involves them becoming electrically active, expressing sodium channels, potassium channels, the sodium-potassium pump, and so forth, in order to have that excitable membrane. Neurons differ, sometimes wildly, in their shape and their chemical components. And that's largely a function of where they're located in the brain. Especially early in development, the neurons are induced to become particular kinds of neurons by their neighbors, specifically by the proteins produced by their neighbors. Generally, the axon grows first. Either it grows during the cell's migration or once it's reached its target. And that's then followed by the development of the dendrites. If it's growing during migration, interestingly, the, the axon will make a synapse. It'll make a connection with another cell. And then the developing neuron will sort of move away from there, leaving a trail of axon behind it. In other cases, the axon grows out from the neuron, which stays stationary. We'll see that in a little bit. The next step is myelination. This is the process by which glia produce the fatty sheath that covers the axons of most neurons, but not all of them. And as we've already learned, myelination speeds up the transmission of neural impulses. There's a pattern to how this occurs. It starts in the spinal cord and then works its way up gradually through the hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain. This process actually occurs for decades. It turns out the prefrontal cortex, the very front of the frontal lobes, isn't completely myelinated until you're in your early to mid-20s. The last step is synaptogenesis. This is the creation of new synapses. This one occurs throughout life because neurons are constantly forming new connections and discarding old ones as a result of experience and learning. That said, synaptogenesis slows considerably later in life. It does become harder to learn new things as we age, but it never completely stops. Now, interestingly, there used to be another bullet point here that said this was the only step that's experience-dependent. But just a couple of years ago, it became clear that that wasn't the case. It turns out myelination as well, which used to be thought to be completely driven by pre-programmed changes in gene expression, it turns out that that's also influenced by experience. For example, rats that are raised in social isolation tend to have much slower rates of myelination than rats that are raised in an enriched and socially active environment. Going back to the time of Santiago Ramón y Cajal, it was believed that no new neurons were formed after the early stages of development. But just in the last 15 or 20 years, scientists started finding exceptions to this rule. They started finding stem cells in the brain. These are undifferentiated cells found in the interior of the brain that in turn generate daughter cells. They divide and form two new cells known as daughter cells. These can then transform into glia or neurons. For example, new olfactory receptors are continually replacing dying ones, at least in many of the other mammal species that have been studied. These neurons are constantly being exposed to the environment in your olfactory epithelium, deep in your nasal passages, and they have a half-life of about 90 days. In other words, they live for about 90 days 
on average before new stem cells differentiate into adult olfactory receptors and take the place of the ones that have died off. But there's also development of new neurons in other parts of the brain. For example, it's been known for about 20 years that songbirds have a steady replacement of new neurons in the parts of the brain that permit singing. Stem cells also differentiate into new neurons in the adult hippocampus of mammals, and it's been shown that these new neurons in the hippocampus help facilitate learning. We'll learn later about the role that the hippocampus plays in long-term memory. The axons of developing neurons have to navigate huge distances in order to find the right targets inside the brain. Even if the developing brain is only the size of a walnut, when you're microscopic, as a neuron would be, finding your way all the way across to the other side of the brain to find the correct target to make a synapse with would be something like walking to the east coast. For a long time, it was unclear how they found their way. One of the early researchers in this area was a scientist by the name of Paul Weiss. It turns out that with some species of amphibians, like the salamander, you can remove the leg from one salamander, sew it onto another one, and before long that new leg will start to function. New axons will grow down into that transplanted leg, and the host salamander will start to use it. The big mystery, though, was how does this occur? How do those axons come to control just the right muscles inside the transplanted leg? One possibility is that these axons are growing down into the transplanted leg and somehow navigating their way to just the right muscle to make synapses there. Weiss discounted this theory. He didn't think it was possible. Instead, he thought that what must be happening is that these axons are growing down into the leg, making synapses all over the place, but that only some neurons can effectively communicate with some muscles. And so even though there were lots of signals, only some of the muscles were tuned in to the signals that the axons were giving them. So this turns out to be wrong. Roger Sperry showed that axons actually do follow chemical trails in order to reach their appropriate target. He called this process chemoaffinity. And he demonstrated it in some really interesting classic experiments, which I'll discuss in a minute. So these growing axons reach their target area generally by navigating gradients of chemicals in which they're attracted by some chemicals and repelled by others. You'll remember that a chemical gradient is just a change in the concentration of something over space. In this case, it's a change in the concentration of certain signaling proteins on the surface of neurons within the brain. The video you're about to see shows the ends of these growing axons called growth cones navigating their way by sort of sniffing for specific signaling molecules. So this is the growth cone. It's not a very good name for it. It's not conical. Uh, instead, it looks kind of like an amoeba. And it's got these little fingers sticking out called philopodia that protrude out in different directions. And there are receptors. There are protein receptors on the surface of the cell membrane here that are kind of sniffing for specific chemicals. And depending on the neuron and depending on the moment, they're either navigating toward higher concentrations or lower concentrations of a given chemical. These are generally proteins secreted by other neurons in the environment that they're growing through. As the philopodia encounter higher concentrations, the cytoplasm will move into those philopodia and out of philopodia that are experiencing lower concentrations. You can see that here. This is a growth cone turning away from a particular chemical, which this bead is coated in. Here's a growth cone turning toward high concentrations of nerve growth factor, which you learned about in your textbook. So how did Roger Sperry figure out that these axons were finding their way to just the right spots, rather than just making synapses all over the place and letting learning or some other mechanism allow the animal to adapt and recover? He did some clever experiments. Here's one. It turns out if you take a newt and cut its optic nerve, which is right here, the bundle of axons connecting its retina to its brain, 
it doesn't have a primary visual cortex, and instead it has something called the optic tectum, which functions kind of like our visual cortex. He cut the optic nerve here, and it turns out that the axons from the retina, carrying those visual signals from the retina, will grow back. They'll grow back, and they'll make synapses again on the optic tectum, and the animal will learn to see again. Don't try this at home. It does not work with humans. Sometimes finding the right experimental research animal is the key to making a discovery like this. That was the first experiment. Cut the optic nerve, it grows back, the animal sees again. That's an important thing to know. But then he did something interesting. He cut the optic nerve and then flipped the eye upside down and backwards. He essentially rotated it 180 degrees in the eye socket. So the eye is still facing outward, but now what's top is now in the bottom and what's in the front is now in the back. And then he waited to see what happened. One possibility is that the animal would relearn to see just fine again. That would suggest that these axons are growing back, making synapses on the optic tectum, maybe at random. But nonetheless, the animal would be relearning to use those new synapses. That wasn't the case, though. This is demonstrating the experiment. First, axons from the anterior part of the retina were projecting to and making synapses with the posterior parts of the tectum. Axons from the dorsal part of the retina were synapsing on the ventral part of the tectum, and so on and so forth. When he cut the optic nerve, he rotated the eye 180 degrees in its socket. But the axons grew back to where they had originally been connected. So axons, for example, that were coming from the posterior part of the retina made synapses again. This is the what used to be the posterior part of the retina, now on the anterior part of the animal. Those axons still grew back to the same spot in the tectum. Axons coming from the ventral part of the retina used to connect to the dorsal part of the tectum. They still do. When the axons grow back, even though now they're coming from what's now the dorsal part of the retina, it used to be the ventral part, and they still grow back and make synapses with the dorsal part of the tectum. This was a crucial finding. It showed that these axons were somehow finding their way back to the appropriate targets, despite coming from a different location. How were they doing it? How were they finding the way? The key was what Sperry called chemoaffinity, using chemicals to navigate and find their way. So here we have the retina, here we have the optic tectum. How are the axons from the retina finding their way to the right part of the tectum? It turns out that there's a gradient of a particular protein called TOPDV, which is short for topography dorsal ventral. Its concentration varies. It's most concentrated on the ventral part of the tectum, least concentrated on the dorsal part of the tectum. Axons coming from the dorsal part of the retina grow toward the tectum, and then they continue to grow toward higher and higher concentrations of top DV until they find their way to the ventral part of the tectum. Axons coming from the ventral part of the retina grow toward the tectum and grow toward lower and lower concentrations of top DV until they reach the dorsal part of the tectum. But what about the front to back or anterior posterior dimension? Turns out there's a second protein whose concentration varies from the front to the back of the retina, such that axons from the front part of the retina, the anterior part of the retina, are navigating their way toward higher concentrations of that chemical, and axons coming from the posterior part of the retina are navigating their way, sort of sniffing for lower concentrations of that chemical. In this way, each of the axons coming from the retina essentially has a 2D coordinate system. They're finding their way to the right spot on the tectum, sniffing out particular concentrations of top DV and this anterior-posterior protein. Similar processes are at work during different stages of embryonic development in mammals too, including humans. Because those axons had grown back to where they had originally been synapsed, the newt now saw the world upside down and backwards, and it never relearned to see correctly. It would respond to stimuli coming from above as if they were coming from below, and stimuli coming from behind as if they were coming from the front of the animal. Sperry did other similar kinds of experiments, 
For example, he swapped patches of skin from the belly and the back of a tadpole before it became a frog. Afterwards, when it became a frog, you would tickle its back and the frog would scratch its belly. You would tickle its belly and it would scratch its back. The axons were growing out from receptors in the skin, sniffing out for the correct cells, the correct cells in the spinal cord that they had been connected to before. The brain then received those signals and continued to think that they were coming from the original spots on the body. So we've learned that in early development, axons can navigate their way to almost exactly the right spot that they're supposed to make synapses. But they don't always know exactly the right spot to make a synapse, and they don't always make the correct number of synapses. After this initial step, the developing organism uses experience and patterns of activity in order to shape and fine-tune the connections. When those axons initially reach their targets, they actually form synapses with many cells. They make more connections than are really needed. We say that they make synapses promiscuously. Those postsynaptic cells, the one that they're making synapses with, end up strengthening some connections and eliminating other connections based largely on the pattern of input, the pattern of activity coming from the incoming neurons. This is sometimes described as neural Darwinism, a kind of survival of the fittest synapses. Some survive, some are pruned away. We've seen this image once before when we were talking about research methods. This is showing you a ganglion cell in the retina of a prenatal cat. And this is a similar kind of cell in the retina of an adult cat. Notice the difference here. Notice how many more little branches there are in the prenatal neuron compared to the adult neuron. There's been a lot of pruning over time. That pruning occurred largely as a result of experience. The patterns of activity in the neurons themselves, causing some synapses to die off and others to be retained. The branches connecting to the synapses that died off are eliminated. They're pruned away. What drives these changes? What allows some synapses to survive while others don't? A class of chemicals called neurotrophins are key for this. Nerve growth factor, which you read about in the text, is just one. These chemicals promote the survival and connectivity of neurons. Trophin comes from the Greek word for nourishment. Axons that are not exposed to neurotrophins after making synapses typically undergo what's called apoptosis. That second P is silent. Apoptosis is a pre-programmed mechanism of cell death. Essentially neurons, and in fact many other types of cells in the body, are programmed to kill themselves unless certain circumstances aren't met. In the case of neurons, the main circumstance that's needed for survival is exposure to sufficient levels of neurotrophins. Because of this apoptosis, this pre-programmed cell death, the healthy adult nervous system typically does not have neurons just hanging around doing nothing. It doesn't have neurons that failed to make appropriate synapses, because the ones that did not simply killed themselves. Importantly, after maturity, these apoptotic mechanisms become dormant. So after damage to the adult brain, you sometimes do end up with neurons that either are not making useful synapses or that end up making sometimes harmful synapses. Here's a dramatic example of apoptosis. This is showing you the number of motor neurons coming down the ventral spinal cord of fetuses at different stages of gestation. You can see at 10 weeks of gestation, there's maybe 170,000 of these motor neurons. But by birth, you've got less than 125,000. What happened to all these axons? The developing brain doesn't know exactly how many motor neurons it's going to need to control the muscles of the lower body. So it sends down more axons than will ultimately be necessary. Many of those neurons make synapses. Many of them don't. The ones that make effective synapses survive. The ones that don't simply kill themselves. They die off and are resorbed by the body. Because there are a variety of chemicals that are so important to ensuring normal development of the brain, changes or perturbations in the chemical environment 
early on in development can have dramatic and negative long-term effects. These early stages of brain development are critical for normal development later in life. So mutations in one gene can lead to many defects if that gene is crucial for helping form the basic body plan. Homeobox genes are one example of this. These are a class of genes, there are many homeobox genes, that help guide the formation of the basic body plan. Mutations in these genes, for example, can cause fruit flies to have legs where their antennae would be. They can cause severe malformations in the humans as well. And chemical distortions in the brain, not genetic changes, but alterations in the, the chemical environment, can cause significant impairment and developmental problems as well. Fetal alcohol syndrome is one common example of this. Children are often born with fetal alcohol syndrome when the mother drinks heavily during certain stages of pregnancy. The condition is marked by hyperactivity and impulsiveness, difficulty maintaining attention, varying degrees of mental retardation, motor problems and heart defects, and facial abnormalities. What's happening here? The exact mechanism depends on the timing of exposure to alcohol. But at least during later stages, the main problem is that alcohol suppresses glutamate receptors and enhances GABA receptors. You might remember that glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system, and GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. So when you suppress glutamate, you tend to decrease the activity of postsynaptic cells. And when you enhance GABA, you also tend to decrease the activity of postsynaptic cells because you're essentially enhancing an inhibitor. The result is much less activity than you would have otherwise, much less brain activity, including much less synchronized activity between presynaptic and postsynaptic cells at the newly formed synapses. Neurons receive less excitation, and that results in too little exposure to neurotrophins. Less activity between pre- and postsynaptic cells results in the postsynaptic cell producing less neurotrophins. And so the presynaptic cells are more likely to undergo apoptosis. And there's also likely to be more pruning. More synapses will be pruned away. More dendritic branches will be pruned away. And in fact, we do observe that the dendrites of children born with fetal alcohol syndrome tend to be shorter and have fewer branches. Here's a dramatic example of how differences in early experience can dramatically change how the brain develops. Remember that development is due both to pre-programmed changes as well as to experience. This is a functional brain imaging study, a functional MRI study, in which they compared the, the responses of the brains of people who could see with the responses of people who were blind from a very early age or from birth, while they were discriminating braille characters. So both groups of subjects we're trying to say whether or not two Braille characters were the same or different. And this is what they observed in the pattern of activity. You can see for people who can see, they have very little, if any, activity in the occipital lobe here. Hopefully you know that the occipital lobe is crucial for vision. This is all visual cortex here. But here's the striking finding. In people who are blind from an early age, discriminating touch with their fingers creates large amounts of activity in what would have been visual areas of the brain. These parts of cortex never got input from the eyes. Instead, they've become wired up to do other things. In this case, they're clearly involved in helping these subjects discriminate braille characters with their fingers. And they probably serve other functions as well.